Okay, I know it's the end of the day, everybody, but I'm hoping to get you involved in this presentation. I can't stand it when I'm stood in the front of a room and everyone's just sat there going, or writing down, or on their phone and trying to pretend they're doing notes. I'm watching. So I'm going to try and make this an interactive session and get you all involved. Is that okay, everybody? To start things off, I'm looking for some big oohs on the uh, animations. <laughs> oh yeah, it's only going uphill from here. So that is actually a pitch in Ireland. That's Donnybrook Park. That's where Ireland A and their junior teams play. And that's where my under 13 team played only last week on our tour. And we're very pleased to be there. It was about that full as well. So, who am I? Hi everybody, my name's Dan. I'm also known as Kanban Dan on Twitter. Although I don't tweet very often these days, I need more encouragement. So I'm blaming you for all that. I am a Kanban trainer, accredited with the LKU. But I'm also a licensed coach. Oh come on, do I not get new for that? Ooh, it's the Rugby Football Union, the RFU. So that's my actual coaching license. I get to carry it around in my wallet and everything. I get a 10% discount at the Twickenham store. <laughs> no, that doesn't deserve a new. No. Not 10%. I've, I spent at least 10 minutes blurring faces in this photograph so I could show you what I do. Because <laughs> I'm not allowed to show kids photographs on something which may end up on the internet. But that's me in the very well-fitting tracksuit on the side and the very nasty cap. Thank you. I like a well-trained audience. So this year, I took the RFU coaching course. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to hear a lot about rugby. Guess what I learned about, though? Turns out, it was all this other stuff, like principles, how to coach, values, complexity theory. Sorry, an RFU rugby coach talking about complexity. Skills acquisition techniques. And also loops, switches, penetrators, blitz, all that kind of thing. Okay, there was some rugby in there. I can't get away from it. But what I have in my bag is a wonderful book that I can't recommend to you. Coaching the 15-a-side game by the RFU, the Scottish Rugby Union, the Welsh Rugby Union. So all rugby coaches in those three countries have to do this class. Uh, and I'm actually licensed to do, do premiership rugby, should I want to. I don't think they're hiring, but... There are there. And there's all sorts in that book about coaching people. Notice the word people, not players. And that's important. So, let's have a look. <laughs> you know, I put that in as a gag. But actually, it's really handy because you can't transition automatically on your slides from, from one of those little animations. So, it's a good little stop to stop you clicking on the next slide by mistake. So, there's actually value in it. I did an experiment without a hypothesis. Look what happened. So, principles. Let's start with principles. Knowing and understanding the principles is the cornerstone to successful coaching. That's word for word, with a few words cut out, because it had to fit on a slide in the RAF. You like words from there. So this is the RFU rugby principles, which are obviously contest, possession, go forward, support, continuity and pressure. Just like in Agile. Okay, maybe not. Different principles, but the point still is valid. Principles make up the point of what we're coaching about. If you don't align to your principles, then you're kind of doing the wrong thing. So they're the foundation blocks. If you're not aligning your strategy of how you're coaching to the principles you're trying to coach, you're probably not going to have very much effect. So for example, if you've got a Gantt chart, which shows how you're doing your agile transition, you've probably got a problem you can work on right there because your practices are not matching your principles. That makes sense? Same rugby, same in, the same in Agile, the same in Kanban. I'm going to use the A word and the K word liberally. In my world, it doesn't really make a lot of difference which I'm talking about. Oh, animations let me down. Can you believe it? There it is. Yay. So, the coaching process. In this book, it says, plan, do, review. Sound familiar, everybody? So you might have heard of Inspect and Adapt, PDCA. 
if you're in one particular corner of Kenevan, you'll talk about probe sense and respond. If you're talking about Kanban, we'll look for validated learning and we'll use Kaizen based on the validated learning, based on the data we have. It's going to get dull after a while, that, isn't it? That's some more feedback I'm taking from the audience directly. <laughs> Coaching styles. So back in the day, I used to work at the computer games company Electronic Arts. Oh, come on, that's got to be a new. <laughs> I was nine years there, man and boy. And then because I became a manager there, I was sent on management training, you know, traditional stuff. And I remember vividly one lesson I learned in that, which was, you've probably heard about management styles. Bad news, you don't get the luxury of having a management style. You need to understand the situation you're in and the person you're managing, and that's how you need to manage. We call that situational management. Well, I call it situational coaching now. So it's again, there are many styles I can choose from, and this is really the important slide for me. And that's why I'm building up slowly. The first thing in rugby, we talk about the tell mode. This is where I make the decisions, and I tell you, the people in my team, what they have to do. The next one is sell. I just, oops, I've clicked on. I decide again, but now instead of telling you what you have to do, I'm trying to sell you on the idea. I'm trying to get you to do what I want and understand why you need to do it. I've just used a very important word if you ever want to be a rugby coach. The word why is mentioned more on this level two rugby course than anything else. If you want people to understand why they should do something, they need to understand the why of it, not the what of it. So you need to coach them to understand why they need to do something. And that's a very important lesson. A lot of, of traditional rugby players who become coaches don't really get that at first, and that's their biggest hurdle. Why is the biggest thing that people need to understand in your teams? The next mode is ask. I'm going to outline the situation. I'm going to ask you for your input. I'm going to give you, get your suggestions in. I've probably got a good idea in mind, but because I know that if you come up with the idea, even if it's different from mine, it may be better or worse than mine, but you're going to buy into it more because it's your idea, not my idea. And people buy into the ideas of their teammates as well. And that's an important thing. The final one we call delegate. So I'm going to set a problem, and I'm going to let you decide how to solve it. That's it. I just set the problem. Here's the scenario. It's 79 minutes down. We're, three minutes, we're 10 points behind. We're in there 22 and we've got a penalty. Are you going to kick for goal? Are you going to do? What are, you, what are your options? What do you want to do? And those options are down to the team to decide. How does that map to us in the agile Kanban community? Well, we talk about prescriptive methods. I actually had a bit of a thing. Did I spell that right? Because I had it down as proscriptive, and I didn't even know that they were two different words. Proscriptive and prescriptive. Prescriptive is like a doctor prescribing what should happen. Proscriptive is saying what shouldn't happen and prescribing you from doing it rather than prescribing you to do it. Who would have thought? I learned that last night. Then we come to sell. That's like mentoring. Hey, this is a really good idea. You should try this thing with your team. Coaching is, well, what do you think? You already have an idea before you ask me that question. What do you think the answer is? That's kind of what we see as traditional true coaching, using Socratic method always answering a question with a question almost. And then you come into complete non-directive. The interesting thing is understanding when you use these modes. When do I go into those situations? So, what do I tell? When should I use that? Audience, over to you. Maybe. That's one idea. Any of those? Disaster situation. Okay. So, safety is what I've put up there. So, the first thing we teach new players in rugby is how to fall over. Most people think they know how to fall over, they don't. What they typically do is put their arm out to protect themselves and break their wrist. What you must never do when you fall over is put your arm out. What you should do is twist, hit your knee, your hip, and your side, and roll. 
you will not be injured. It's a lot easier to do when you're holding one of these. Uh, this is a miniature one. If you're holding a ball, you can't put your hand out because you're going to lose the ball all over the place. One hand's a bad thing. So when it's safety, we come into that. So the first thing is, this is how you do that. If you're thinking now about complexity, you're thinking about Kinevin, you're thinking about the obvious domain, there is a best practice. Knee, hip, shoulder, roll. Simple. The next one we teach them is how to tackle. Now, this is an important one because, can I borrow you, Ali? I told you it was going to be an interactive session. So here, catch this. Hey, if you're running here and I'm going to tackle you, there's a very important side where I've got to tackle. Firstly, I've got to come low, but if I put my head on this side, what's happening is all of Ali's weight's going to come onto my neck and go crack like that. And I'm going to be lying on the floor waiting for an ambulance while everyone else can't even play the game unless they go to another pitch. Simple thing, but you have to come this side and take them down that way. Now, that's a simple safety thing. So whenever we're running a training session, if we see one of our players, the wrong side, we stop. We have a nice little directive device, which we blow very firmly. That tells everyone to stop what they're doing so no one gets hurt. And we show them how to do it correctly in a very directive method. Thank you. Cheers. And we actually you then use a little metaphor, because metaphors are good for remembering, and little rhymes. We call it cheek to cheek. So you may have noticed when I come in, my cheek was at least cheek. And the next one, we have ring of steel. We like to make it nice and easy for people to remember things, because people don't learn very well, so you need to trick them into learning. Interesting. So safety situations is where we get very prescriptive. And if you think about the world of work, similarly, you've got to think about when things are going to be safe to do and when things are not going to be safe. I didn't start my timer. Isn't that terrible? I meant to time myself properly. But you've got to tell people when things are unsafe. They may be doing something which organisationally is an unsafe thing to do for them and putting themselves in danger. And that's why we say, no, don't do that. You're going to get yourself fired or you're going to get the team fired or you're going to lose that client. That's where we tend to get very directive. You often hear about people turning into command and control mode. Yeah, that's typically when we're in this mode. Sell, we already had new to this, so I'm going to take that. So this is where, hey... If we tackle like this, then we're not going to go into hospital and never be able to walk again. That's a really good idea, idea isn't it? But no, we want to sell the idea of, hey, how are we going to pass the ball? Because there are different ways. So there you go. There's a pass. Is that the right way to pass? Does anyone do rugby here? I should have asked that earlier. Hmm? Well, I'll pretend you were backwards of me. I could be facing any direction in rugby. Does anyone play rugby here? OK. So was that a good pass? Or perhaps I'll do it like that. Yep. Or perhaps I'll do it like that. The point is, there are multiple good ways to pass a rugby ball, and it depends on the context. If I'm passing to someone who's out the door, I'm not going to be doing that, because I'm going to give the slowest, loopiest pass, and someone's going to intercept it. So I'm going to have to use this technique and get my high elbow, and I'm going to have to spin my hand over the ball, and it'll go flat and long that way. And I'll explain to the players, hey, if we do this, then we're not going to have an interception and we're not going to look ridiculous when you make that pass and your teammates aren't going to give you a lot of flack in the bar afterwards. Well, if you're a bit older. So it's about selling method. <laughs> so I've talked about there are multiple ways to pass the ball and in each context, they're the right way to do it. Good practice. So if you know your, again, if you know your complexity theory in Kinevin, you'll think about multiple good practices where things are complicated. You start seeing an, a, a real match between the complexity and actually the way we actually want to coach people. So coaching is where people are more experienced. So if you already know the answer, I don't want to tell you, because you know the answer. I want you to tell me, because it's going to be much more powerful, yeah? Uh, is anyone here not a coach of some, short, some shape? I've made a huge assumption, sorry, that everyone here coached. But this is typically what we see as coaching is... I remember hearing from a colleague, who shall remain, remain nameless, that a client didn't want them anymore. Why? Because the team came up with all their own ideas. And therefore, she wasn't producing any value as a coach. It's like, what? That's mental. That's what coaching is about, getting the team to come up with their own ideas. How much skill is involved in getting the team to come up with their own ideas? It's really the most difficult way of doing things. 
And if it's not valued, you've got a real problem. So actually, understanding you're in that mode, and when you have people who know the answers, let them decide the answers. They'll stick with them, or they will, as the rugby union put it, abide by those decisions better. Delegate. That's typically where you've got experts. If I'm coaching a senior team as the first 15, there's a good chance they know as much about rugby or more about certain parts of rugby than I do. If it's about how you get a tight spiral when you're kicking a ball into the corner, look at me, I was never a fly off. <laughs> I don't really know the skills. I can kind of work out the mechanics and I can look it up online. But the guy who does it every Saturday for a living has probably got more of a clue. If I happen to be with the England team as coach, I can still coach them despite the fact that they all have a higher skill level in what they do than I do. Why? Because I'm a coach and they're players. My job isn't to tell them how to do things. My job is to get them to come up with the best outcomes. And as Chris and uh, I've forgotten his colleague's name already, that's terrible, isn't it? I know Chris though, so I'll use his name. Build the best thing. It's about the best outcome coming out of the coaching session, not me giving the team the best outcome. Does that make sense? Hopefully you all know this already. <laughs> so I should be in this mode here with you guys. Hey, that means we end of the slide. Of course, there's too much data on it already. Planning. Again, I was quite amazed to see that written in here. In a, it's in a nice little emphasis box in a corner somewhere. And they're really trying, oh, you see, I'm trying to show an emphasis box and I've failed. But it was in a nice little emphasis box to really make it highlight. And you probably recognize the quote. Anybody know the source of that one? It's obviously a big paraphrase. Churchill? Eisenhower. Close. Same era, when he was a general, Second World War. He said, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. He was talking about military, but he was talking about taking people into a complex scenario and having had a plan and seeing what happened to that. And guess what? Military campaigns are complex scenarios. Rugby games are complex scenarios. And also, software development or knowledge work of any kind is complex and adaptive. I don't know if you went to Liz's talk. If you did, you'll know that. And it's only worth doing a project if you're doing something no one's ever done before. So there's always going to be complexity. There's always going to be emergence. And your plan is always going to fail. However, having done the planning is in indispensable. Because then you can try and align to your goals. So I'm going to plan this session on training. And we're going to do the 10 passes, well, the uh, 13 comes in front of the 12, and the 10 makes a decision on 10, uh, 12 or 13, depending on how the defence reads it. Situation. Yeah. Complicated rugby scenarios, and it's all about reading what the opposition does and understanding how to get the thing. I'd never heard of that move before. I'd been watching rugby all my life. It's called the slice move. But understanding how that we can use our players to the benefit based on what the defence is doing in front of us it's giving them the option. So we have, in the coaching plan, I've got a plan for how to get that information into at least three players who are going to be in that situation so they can read what's going in front of them and make the best outcome. Now, you'll have seen that if you've ever watched England score, um, play rugby and you've seen Manu Tuolagi score a try. They were doing the 12-13 slice, trust me. They use it for him an awful lot. But when you're planning, you've got to be flexible because what you're expecting to happen probably won't. And it, you, what you want is the goals, not the plan to be followed. What does it look like? Well, it looks like that. No, it looks like that. So that's my workbook, and that's me doing the plan for the uh, 13 in front of 12 slice move. And you can see here, obviously you can read all of this writing perfectly. What we've got is a warm-up. Then we've got this model of whole part whole. You. So we can say, hey, let's get the players warmed up, but let's do it in a way that actually gets them warmed up to doing the thing we're going to do. Then we'll all play another game that will emphasize the point we're trying to make, the need for it, usually. We'll then go into a part and really focus on, well, what we can do is we can have the 13 there, the 12 there, and if the defense really comes to him, then we pass the 12 and he can glide through. 
or if they read the 12, we can pass the 13, and you can hammer his way through like a big lad, like two or like years. And we draw some diagrams, because pictures are really useful. And then we come back to the hall again, and we try it out in the bigger scenario, and did it work? You can see a bit more detail here. Again, more diagrams. It's all very lovely, isn't it? Here, we have some core values. How does this plan affect the values that we've talked about? Okay, the rugby values in this case. And here, we're going into the, what we call the five C's. I'll mention them later and explain it, but you can see there's, you've got to pick one of the five C's that this thing aligns to. And then how do we cool down? Well, we're just going to jog in and pick up all the cones, because that saves me having to pick up all the cones, and that's a good thing. And then here is my little retrospective, where I've talked to other coaches and the players and said, how did that go? What did I learn? What did I learn for myself? Here I've got a nice little bit of feedback. It says, give specific feedback. What was lovely? Now, because I wrote that down, not because I read it, I remember that on the day when we ran this exercise, I watched it and went, yeah, lovely. And the guy next to me says, yeah, that was a fantastic line. And my coach trainer said to me, so what did you do there? What word do you always use? I'm, I don't know. He says, you always say lovely. Everything's lovely in your world. I thought, that's strange. I'm six foot two in this size, and I talk about things being lovely all the time. And he says, what the guy next to you did, was he gave very specific feedback about what was lo lovely, what was good. Therefore, what I can do next time, and what the other players can learn from what I did. So actually giving that specific feedback was a big learning for me. And actually writing it down here caused me to remember it. Not reading it, but writing it down. So that's a rugby plan. And it went really well on the day, as it goes. Thank you for asking. <laughs> we played a little game where there was more attackers than defence. Get nobody ever scored any tries. We did my thing, then we went back to the same game. And every time we scored a try. So we took something that wasn't working, focused it, and made an improvement. And everyone enjoyed doing it. And because you're all in here, and you didn't choose the game session next door, I'll point out, we're not allowed to run training. It, we don't do drills anymore in rugby. Everything is a game-based exercise. We run games. We find little games that go along with the big game. Ways to emphasize certain points by gameplay, because people learn better by doing things than they learn by listening, like in a classroom like you lot are. Sorry, you should have all gone next door. <laughs> I'm assuming they're playing games rather than just talking about games. Isn't yeah, you, you're like the no fun group. What are you choosing this one for? Anyway. Woo, there's the ball. And an extra click, I don't know why. So we always run review with those people, what went well, what not went so well, and what would you do differently? How does it affect the plan for the next session? The important thing is not that we stuck to the plan, but that we got those values and those goals over to the players, we got them to the team. How does that apply to us? Anyone got any thoughts? What's the equivalent? Retrospective. Absolutely. Plan your retrospective. Is it always going to go how you expect it? Uh, last week I had the trickiest retrospective of my entire life, where everybody in the retrospective um, decided to give me a value out of six of how much they wanted to keep doing Agile. The highest score was three. Mostly were two. But by the end of it, we were going to be more Agile again which is very interesting. The team came bound to that. I wasn't expecting that at all. I got quite low in that retrospective, but the team came up, which is how it works. We played off of each other, and we got to a better place. Hopefully, this week's going better. I don't know, because I took Friday off to write this, and I'm here today. <laughs> it's all your fault if it's gone wrong, by the way. I'm blaming you, each of you. So yes, you should retrospect on your retrospectives. Just a thought. Bring another coach in. I think you all know about this technique of having another coach come in and run your retrospective for you so you can participate. How about having just an observer? Neutral observer who can just say, well, I thought this was good, I thought that was bad. Give you feedback as a coach, a coaching coach. It's really useful if you can get it. Get the feedback from the players. What did you think? The players, the team, the people in your retrospective. Same sort of thing. Retrospect on your retrospective. It's gone very meta now, hasn't it? I should have put a thing saying you're nearly in the home straight. 
values. You might find some of these very familiar. We call them treads so we can remember them. Teamwork, that sounds pretty agile. Respect, enjoyment. How many te agile teams want to have fun in the office? Hopefully they all do, right? Discipline. In rugby, that means sticking to the rules, but also it means doing the right thing in the right situation and looking after each other. Sportsmanship. Hard to align that to agile until you have a think about it and think, well, actually, what do we mean by sportsmanship? Being fair, being reasonable with the people around us. It actually does fit quite well. I've heard several references. I know Pavel was in talking today about um, agile being a team sport. And it is, it's a sport, and sportsmanship's a really good thing. However, it even says this in the book, values cannot be imposed and need to be agreed in order for people to abide by them. Notice the word people, not the word players. And I love the use of the word abide. I think apart from in the hymn, we hardly ever hear the word abide. We should bring back the word abide. But I think it's an important word. You don't always have to agree with something to abide by it. If the team and the rest of the team agrees, then there's more imperative for you to abide by something and give it a go. Give it a feral crack of the whip, as they may say down under. And I think that's something that needs to be understood. As long as you've got consent, you don't need consensus. In fact, consent always beats consensus. Buzzword bingo. I got Kenevin in here. Yay! Has anyone not heard of Kenevin? I'm like the fifth person today talking about it. You've been in all the wrong sessions. But it looks like this, and it's a complexity model. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it. I'm sure those who know about it already will be pleased to know. Um, Liz Keogh is around. I don't know if she's in here. She's a much more Kenevin expert than I am. Or have a look on the Cognitive, website, Cognitive Edge website. Down here, I talked about this earlier, best practice is the obvious. This is something a child could do. Bear in mind, my players are all kids of 13, so actually kids can do some of this stuff too, it turns out. Up here, we talk about good practices. In the complex adaptive zone, we talk about emergent practices. And in the chaotic zone, novel practices. That's where new ideas come from. Occasionally, someone has a new idea in rugby, and we have to make new laws to stop Richie McCaw being the only person who ever gets the ball. Again, if you know rugby, that was a joke. If not, flat as a pancake. <sighs> I'm trying here. OK, so that was Kenevan. I was surprised when this came up, but I was told. So I say rugby, meaning rugby union, which is the only important rugby game. However, coaching in rugby league is very different to coaching in rugby union. Coaching in rugby league is pretty much always prescriptive. Thou shalt do this, or thou shalt get off the park and never play for my team again. And I thought, why? Why would you do it that way there, when we do it much more about based on getting players to make intuitive decisions? And that's what, again, we see in the Agile world. We want our team members to make intuitive decisions based on what's going on. And I was like, oh, why is this? And it dawned on me. In rugby league, if you've watched it, the tackle goes something like this. Run, run, run. Oh no, I've been tackled. I lie on the floor. The tackler lies on top of me for 10 seconds. I simulate having some sort of heart attack. <laughs> Eventually I stand up. The tackler stands in front of me with a friend. And I stand up with a friend behind me, put the ball down between my legs, roll it back. He passes it to the guy there, who runs up here, gets tackled. Flop, 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 again. But every tackle is the same. Every tackle is clean. Every tackle is obvious. When you get tackled, the same thing will always happen. The only thing that changes is if it's the fifth tackle, somebody kicks the ball rather than running. I don't understand why people watch rugby league. It's really a dull sport. But each to their own. If you're from Yorkshire or Lancashire, I apologize. Rugby union is not like that. Rugby union is far more complex than the tackle. When you're tackled, the tackler must release you, you must release the ball, then based on what's going on, all sorts of things can happen. If the ball's on the floor, then you've got a rook. If the, if the ball's 
um, held up. You've got a more situation with a different set of rules. Um, if no people arrive, you've just got a plain tackle and anybody on their feet can pick the ball up. Um, once a rook's formed, you've got, well, have I got enough support? Have they got more people? Are, are they even going to contest the ball? Are they just going to line up and defend? Are we in their half? Are we in our half? What's the time? What's the score? There are so many factors that make that situation a very complex situation that trying to say, well, what I want you to do is when you're tackled, you will do this, would not make sense. We aren't on the field with the players. Coaches are off on the sideline having heart attacks mainly from what I can tell of my own experience. Certainly of this Sunday, we won by five points in the last play of the game. Yay. Um, and because of that, the players have to know to be able to make intuitive decisions. So we want to coach them to understand that there are options and to be able to read the game themselves and to develop as people to do that. And we want them not to just do that in the field of rugby. We want them to do that in life. So I'm going to miss a lot of what I was going to talk about because I've rambled a bit too long in particular areas. But I'm going to rush into that. So develop play, uh, people, not just players. Has anyone seen the School of Hard Knocks? It's a fabulous charity and Sky TV programme based around rugby. What happens is two former internationals, one from Wales and one from England, go to very deprived areas of the United Kingdom and they get people who are unemployed usually long-term unemployed or have never worked, to sign up to the programme. And they get 20, 30 young men, or, or men, I should say, um, to sign up. And they teach them how to play rugby. And they teach them how to have values. And respect is one of the key values. Respect for self and respect for others. You then go on, they play a training match, and then finally they build up to the big match at the end. And everyone thought that was the big thing. But it isn't. There's a jobs fair. And that's become the big thing. Because all of these unemployed and predominantly unemployable people, most of them end up getting jobs. Because they've been turned around by suddenly being aligned with, I'm worth something. And I can work in a team. It's not just down to me. And I can respect myself. And I can rely on these other people when my body is physically on the line to look after me. And I will look after them. And that's a big change for a lot of people. So by going through these values and learning these things, it really turns real people's lives around. I'm working with kids, 13-year-old boys. I think it's about under nines where girls go on a separate path. 13-year-old boys, I'm looking at this, this group, and a lot of people in here used to be 13-year-old boys. Anyone enjoy that? <laughs> I didn't. Being 13 and a boy was hard. It was everything's confusing and everything's changing. Guess what? I'm one of the people that these 13-year-old boys talk to about strange things. Because um, they don't want to talk to their parents always and they don't always want to talk to school teachers. And I'm a constant in their lives, which is kind of weird. So I'm actually part of developing these young boys into being young men. And I know, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> so we talk about the five C's. I mentioned these earlier. So we talk about getting competence in things, skills, get, actually giving them skills with, the, skills with a rugby ball, how to pass the thing better, but also how to deal with situations and read situations and understand what's going on. But also confidence and self-worth. Here's something you can be good at. Here's something where you can be relied on and rely on other people. Connection, being part of a team, that's really important. Character, understanding, empathy. Sympathy, fairness, and creativity. Finding your own solutions, not being told the solutions. What do you think we should do here? And even more in this one, connection. At 13, is the first time we have league fixtures in this country, which means that we have an opposition, and after the game, they get into a jacket and tie, and they sit down and have a meal with the opposition in the bar. And they have a chat and nominate a best player from the opposition and from us, and sometimes play games with each other. But basically socialise with the opposition after they've just been knocking ten bells out of each other on a rugby pitch. To say, hey, we're actually part of a family. <coughs> we just went on tour. We went over to Dublin, hence the background. And we went to two clubs and, met th and we met three different clubs and a school over there who we played against. And they were all invited to come back to us sometime, next year or the year after. 
So they've got this bond with people who do the same things as us around the world. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Anyone here on a Kanban community around the world at all, where they talk to people they've probably never even met and have a common connection? Anybody? Yeah. And so it's a really good thing, and it is very similar to this. And I think it's a very special thing, and it's something we should be in charge of fostering within our community, actually. And it's something I see very strongly in rugby. I don't see that so much in football, for example. Paul tends to be more about rivalry than togetherness, having that bit at the end where everyone comes together and is part of the same family. And I think the Agile community kind of has it a bit, and the Kanban community is small enough that it definitely has it. There's a, there is definitely a worldwide Kanban community, and we should all take it upon ourselves to keep that as alive as we possibly can, because that is special. They have guilt in you now. You won't expect guilt when you came into this way. Skill acquisition. This new to anybody? Hopefully not, but this is typically what you go through when you're acquiring new skills. You learn about what the skill is. So when you want to do a spin pass, you take the ball that you're holding equally on both sides, you move that hand a bit back over the top and keep that elbow high and you point with that hand to where the pass is meant to go. Do you all understand how to do a spin pass now? Like that, and point to where it's going to be. That's easy, right? I've told you what to do. You're all experts now, right? Turns out not. No, you need to learn it. How do you learn? You practice. And you learn that passing to your right, i.e. left hand passing, is a lot harder than passing to your left unless you're dominant on the other hand. It's funny how at 13 year olds, seriously, all of the good backs moves go to the left wing <laughs> with the right hand passing. So we do this associative still, where we do this over and over again, practice, we learn what we do, till it becomes automatic. I used to play ice hockey, <laughs> weird skill, I know, but I gave up rugby because I got too injured <laughs> and I wanted to do something. So one thing you'll learn about ice hockey is if you do it in this country, you're going to be playing at like 2 a.m. because that's when you get the ice time, but you're also going to be playing with people from Eastern Europe and North America and Canada who are very, very, very good skaters. And when you watch them do something, it's different to how I would do it as a Brit. When I'm on the ice, I'm thinking about what my feet are doing the whole time, because I've got to really think, right, I'm going forward, right? Oh, no, no, now it's a backwards crossover. This is quite hard. I can do it to my left, but not so much to my right. Yet, if you watch a Canadian, they're only thinking, where am I going to put this pass? They're not skating forwards, sideways, or backwards. They're doing all of that. They just don't care what they're thinking about. Where's the killer pass? How do I play the game? They're playing a different they're playing a different game to me, effectively, because they've been through this, because they were skating since they were like this high. So I think that maps pretty much well to what we do as well. If you're going to learn about TDD, you can learn about the theory, but you learn by the practice. You're going to learn about Agile, you can learn the theory, you can go on a two-day class, but you learn through the practice of doing it. This I had trouble with. I didn't want to put this in. I didn't want to put this in for a good reason. I think it's a really good idea having a philosophy. Because it does do this. It does maintain clarity, direction of focus in the way that you coach. And it does help align your own behaviours as a coach with what you're trying to do. And it is a good idea to start with why am I coaching? What am I trying to get out of it? What's in it for me? Because that will explain why I do what I do and help me do what I do better. And it's absolutely true that my philosophy will evolve. And that is my, my rugby training coaching philosophy. Fun, focused, fair. Help the players be the best people they can be. I think that's important when you're especially dealing with young boys. Mm -hmm. What I haven't put up there is my agile or Kanban coaching philosophy. Because for some reason, I have neglected to do one. And I feel really guilty about that. So I wasn't going to do this slide, but then I thought, that's not exactly aligned to my own principles and values, is it? Which kind of means I have to miss most of the presentation off at this stage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work this out. What should my philosophy be? What kind of coach do I want to be on a day-to-day -day basis in my professional life? And I think that will help me do my job better. And my challenge to you is, can you sleep at night if you don't do the same? Really? <laughs> Have a think about it. See if it, you, you think it might help you. Give it a go. There's no set format. It can even be a picture. In fact, there's an example of a sailing ship. 
you know, like an America's Cup type thing. Culture. I was so impressed with what's in the manual that I didn't even bother writing anything, I just copied a photograph. A successful team rarely, rarely relates to its talent. You don't all need to be ninja coders to have a successful team. A successful team is probably not about the talent in the team, it's about the team. It's about having the right environment. It's about having the importance of continuous personal development and a philosophy. It's about having a vision which is clear and agreed. It's about being able to demonstrate the core values and leadership. And if that, that's pure agile for me. That's exactly what we train people to be all the time. And even this bit, further reading, the five dysfunctions of a team. Again, common reading in the agile coaching community for a reason. This stuff's the same. Agile turns out is a team sport. And I think I'm just about out of time. But this is my very last slide. There is a key difference I've noticed between rugby coaching and agile coaching. At least if you're on tour. <laughs> That's me and the other forwards coach. You can tell where the forwards coach is for the under 13s, can't you? This is where I meant to ask if you have any questions, but we have no time. I'm happy to take questions outside, though, but also happy to take feedback. I've been Dan Brown. You've been magnificent people. <laughs> Despite the fact it's the end of the day, off we go. Thank you. Cheers.